In this video, I'm gonna show you the absolute basics of getting started with Apple Motion. And to do that, we're gonna create a really simple logo intro animation for your channel to use over and over again. Also, if you're a patron, I have this as a download for you to jump inside, poke around, change anything that you like, and use in your own videos. When you first open Motion, it should greet you with this project browser. If it doesn't greet you with this, you'll need to go up to File, then select New from Project Browser. Inside of the Project Browser, here on the left side, you'll see all of the plugins you have installed inside of Final Cut Pro. Then in the middle here, you'll see that we have the Motion Project, the Final Cut Effect, the Final Cut Generator, the Final Cut Transition, and finally the Final Cut Title. You're gonna use these different project types depending on what sort of template you wanna build for Final Cut Pro. However, if you're not intending on building a template for Final Cut, then you're just gonna to wanna to select the Motion Project. For this video, we're gonna go ahead and create a Final Cut title. Then moving to the top right-hand corner, you're gonna see a few more options. First and foremost is the preset, which is going to be the resolution of your project. So for this demo, we're gonna go ahead and just select Broadcast HD 1080. For the frame rate, we're gonna go ahead and work with a 2997 frame per second project. However, I strongly recommend that you set both of these settings, the resolution and the frame rate, to whatever you typically like to work with inside of Final Cut Pro. With that in mind though, if you do ever apply this to a project with a different frame rate or different resolution, Apple Motion and Final Cut Pro do an amazing job of interpolating your project to that new frame rate and resolution. So you really don't need to stress about it too much, but if you want the closest representation of how this is going to look in your final project, I would typically select the settings that I use in Final Cut Pro. Just underneath that, you will see the duration option. Now by default, it might be set to something like frames or time code, but let's go ahead and set it to seconds and I'm gonna leave it at three seconds. From there, we can go ahead and push open. This is pretty much how Apple Motion is always going to look when you first open it. Here on the far left side is your library and also your inspector. Your library is going to be used to access different assets that are found inside of Apple Motion. For example, you can find stuff like generators, you can find different shapes, gradients, fonts, and you can even go as far as to find filters and behaviors. Your inspector is where you're going to make all the changes to whatever objects you're working with in the scene. For example, on this title, we could change stuff like the face color since we're in the appearance tab. We could go to the properties to change stuff like the position, the rotation, scale, and pretty much anything else you can think of. You'll also notice that we have a tab for our behaviors and our filters. So when we apply those different aspects to an object in side of motion, we can make those changes within these different tabs. Just to the right of the inspector is our layers panel. In here you can see your project, which is at the very top, and in here you can change stuff like your resolution and your duration. Underneath that is going to be all of the different layers inside of your project. Now all of your layers always need to be placed within inside of a group. So you'll see that Apple Motion has already placed these two objects inside of this singular group. But you can have multiple groups, and I'm gonna show you why groups are really powerful inside of Apple Motion in just a little bit. Then to the right of that is of course your viewer. This is where you're going to be seeing all of the different elements that you are working with inside of Motion. If you ever happen to run into an issue where maybe you bumped a button and some of your rendering issues are weird, maybe everything's just black and white or everything turns red, you can go ahead and take a look at this menu here and you'll see that we have the color mode. Just make sure that you're set to color so everything looks proper. But in here you can also set it to show just the transparency, you can set it to show an alpha overlay, but for for the most part, you're gonna to wanna to work with color. Then at the bottom of the screen, just like inside of Final Cut Pro, you are going to see your timeline. However, this timeline, unlike Final Cut Pro, is not magnetic. That means that if I were to click and drag something inside of this timeline, it's just gonna stay in the exact position that I drag it to. I'm gonna go ahead and undo that with Command Z and you can undo or redo anything with Command Z or Command Shift Z. So now that we have a basic overview of all the different things inside of Apple Motion, let's go ahead and build our first project. 
I'm gonna go ahead and select the title background and type text here layers and delete those with backspace. Now that those are gone, let's go ahead and add in a circle shape. If we go to the very bottom of the viewer, you'll see a whole bunch of different tools here. Click on this down arrow next to the rectangle and in here you'll see that we have a rectangle tool, a circle tool, and a line tool. I wanna go ahead and work with the circle. Selecting that, we should have a little bit of a difference in our cursor and I can go ahead and just click and drag anywhere inside of our viewer and I'm gonna hold shift, which is going to make this circle perfectly symmetrical in shape. I'll go ahead and release that and we can see over here in the layers panel that it has now created a circle. Additionally, we can select that circle and have all of these different options inside of our inspector. You'll notice under the position settings that it's slightly offset from the center. Now there's a couple different ways we could change this. We could of course click and drag directly on the numbers if we wanted to. We could also click directly on the number and type in whatever value we want. Or finally, my favorite way if I ever need to reset something back to its default state, click on this down arrow and then select reset parameter. Another way you could do that is just right click on the parameter and then select reset parameter. Now that that's reset, I wanna go ahead and go inside of the shape settings. So we'll click on the shape tab. In here, we can adjust stuff like the fill or the outline. And additionally, we can go inside of the geometry settings. In here, we can affect our radius. Now I want this circle to fill out the entire screen. So we're gonna to need to drag this radius way up. And you'll notice that we get to a thousand in our radius, but it's still not quite filling out all of the edges. So to fix that, we can actually click and drag directly on a lot of the different numbers inside of motion. And that will allow us to go beyond the given value that is there. So I found that going just a little over 1,100 seems to be a pretty good level for this circle. So that is one way you can adjust the scale of different shapes inside of Apple Motion. But there's also another way, which is very similar to how you adjust the scale of something inside of Final Cut Pro. To do that, let's go back over to the properties panel and in here you'll see the scale. Each of these different parameters have a little arrow next to it. That means we can go ahead and expand this by clicking on it. This now gives me an X value, a Y value, and a Z value, which would be helpful if we were working with a 3D object. If I were to click and drag directly on the line that is above all of these, that's going to affect all of them at the same time. I'll go ahead and collapse the scale and let's set the value of this all the way down to zero. I wanna go ahead and animate the scale of this popping in. Let's take our playhead and move back to the very first frame of our project. Then going back up to the scale value, we can click to add a keyframe. And just like inside of Final Cut Pro, that will turn your grayed out diamond into a golden one. Let's move forward inside of the timeline about 20 frames. And you can tell that that's the 20th frame by looking at our time code right here. Let's go back to the scale value and set this to 100. And because we have changed the value you after adding a keyframe, it's gonna go ahead and automatically add a keyframe for us. Now there's a few different ways we can take a look at keyframes inside of Apple Motion. The simplest and easiest method is to go to the very bottom right and make sure this icon is enabled. When we click on that, we can see the different keyframes we have added. However, this doesn't give us a lot of info. While we can click and drag directly on these keyframes to speed up an animation, that's pretty much all we can do with it. So if we wanted this to be only 10 frames, we could drag those over. If we want finer control over our keyframes inside of Apple Motion, that is where the keyframe editor comes into play. To get to the keyframe editor, go to the far right and find these three diamonds. Clicking on that, you can see that that pops up this additional little window. I'll go ahead and expand that by clicking on this line here and we can drag that up as high as we need. And I'll go ahead and shrink down our viewer just a little bit so we have more space to see both our timeline and our keyframe editor. Now the keyframe editor has a ton of really complex and powerful tools. This video definitely does not have time to get into all of that, but I can show you some of the basics of working with keyframes in inside of Apple Motion, which has far more control and power than what's found over inside of Final Cut Pro. We can change the interpolation of all of our keyframes. Right now, you'll notice that this line is very linear. That is going to give us a jarring and jagged animation, and maybe we want something a little bit more fluid. 
To change these keyframes, we can go ahead and just click and drag over all of the keyframes, right click, go down to interpolation, and in here you'll see we have a whole bunch of different interpolation modes. The one that I love using is the Bezier interpolation mode. Selecting that, you'll notice that it gives us two extra handles. These handles will control the points that they're next to. So for example, we could go ahead and select this first keyframe, then clicking and dragging on that handle, you can see how we can shape the animation keyframes. I'm gonna go ahead and hold shift and that will lock this handle to the different axes. We can select this secondary point and we'll find the handle. I'm gonna hold shift and just lock that back so that we have this really nice S shape to our animation. So going back to the very beginning, if we push play, we can see how that looks. That just has a really nice fluid animation to it. So that's some of the basics of working with the keyframe editor, but there's actually some other really cool ways to animate inside of motion. To showcase those, I'm first gonna bring in a logo that I want to animate. Selecting the group that we want to bring the logo into, we can go to the top left-hand corner and push this import button. You can also achieve that with Command I. In here, we can locate the logo that we want to use and push import. Now I want this logo to stand out against the background. To achieve that, let's go ahead and select our circle and go into the style settings. In here, we can find our fill color and I'm just gonna select this eyedropper and select the color that I want to work with. So I want this darker teal color. To animate this, let's go back over into the properties panel and then select our logo image. And here you can see that it has a scale factor just like our circle did, but rather than animating the scale directly, we can click on this down arrow and go down to add parameter behavior. Parameter behaviors are extremely powerful inside of Apple Motion and they're one of my most favorite features. Some of these can actually be seen almost as an animation preset, but it allows you to control all the different values within that preset to get you the exact animation that you want. One of my favorite parameter behaviors is the overshoot parameter. Now that I've selected that, you can see that in our behaviors tab, we have the overshoot parameter. The first parameter here is the start value, and that is set to 0%. What that 0% value is telling us is that it has a 0% change. We need to actually go ahead and type in negative 100%. So now we are negating the original 100% value that this image had. So if I scroll back to the very beginning, we can see that our logo image shrinks down to nothing. Taking a look inside of our keyframe editor though, you can see that the animation is taking place over the three second period that we set up for this project. So the animation is going to be extremely slow. I want to go ahead and adjust for that. I don't want the animation to start off right at the beginning. So let's go ahead and click and drag our logo image inside of our timeline over just a few frames. I'm thinking something like 10 frames is a pretty good spot. Now I want this logo image to stop animating at the first one second mark. So to achieve that, go ahead and select your overshoot parameter. There's a couple different ways we could shrink this down. One is to go ahead and just push O and that will trim whatever layer you have selected to the player head. Another way to shrink it down is to go ahead and just click and drag on the edge and you can shrink or extend that out as much as you need. So now that we've done that, you can see that the animation is taking place over a much shorter period of time. So pushing play, you can see how that pops in really nicely. This animation actually shoots up past the 100% mark and then goes back down and then back up. It has a nice elastic feel to it. What we can do to change that elastic is go on over to the left side and you'll see stuff like the ramp duration. So if we wanted this to be a more impactful animation, we could bring that ramp duration down to something like 20% and we could change the cycle I'm gonna go ahead and just set that to one. So now it's just one large animation. Pushing play, it pops in really nicely. Now maybe we wanna add even more dynamics to this logo. The overshoot parameter can also be applied to the rotation. You could go into your properties and apply the rotation parameter by using this down arrow, but another way is to select the overshoot parameter that we previously applied and push Command D. That is going to duplicate it. We could rename it by double clicking on it and I'll go ahead and just change the name to be rotation. So now it says overshoot rotation if I were to expand this out. Go on over to the left side and at the very bottom, you'll see the apply to value. In here, you'll see that it's applying it to the properties.transform.scale. So what we could do is change it by clicking on this down arrow. We'll go to properties, transform, and this time rather than selecting scale, we can go up to rotation and we could have it apply on all of the different axes. But in this instance, I want it to only apply to the Z axis. 
axis. Now if we go back to the beginning, we should see it rotating in really nicely. Now we can adjust how much of that rotation is being applied if we go to the start value and change it over to something like negative 90 degrees. We could change the ramp duration and the cycles. So pushing play, we've completely changed how that logo pops in. Now I really like how the cycles look at one, but it's totally up to you how you want that to look. With those two parameter behaviors, we've made a really dynamic animation and we didn't have to understand the fundamentals of creating a really great animation by using the keyframe editor. Another thing we might want to take a look at is adding in some nice text here at the bottom. I definitely want to give a little bit of space for that. So selecting our logo, we could go ahead and drag that up to give us a little bit more space. Now what's really great about using the parameter behaviors is that they're still going to apply no matter where we place this logo. So we don't have to worry about the different key frames conflicting with moving the position around. Now that we've moved that, let's find our text tool by selecting the T here at the bottom of the viewer. I'm going to go ahead and type in something like subscribe, or you could have it say something like new videos every week. It's really up to you what you want this to say. From there, we can go on over into the format settings and we can change stuff like the font, or we could change the size. We could change the alignment. And I want this subscribe text to be directly in the center. To do that, I'm going to select my arrow tool and we can just click and drag. And you'll notice that motion actually has some nice alignment tools to help us line that up directly in the center. We can also see exactly where the position is in the top left hand corner of the viewer. Now we could animate the entirety of this text all at once, but what's really cool about Apple Motion is all of the available tools for animating your text in really nicely. I'm going to go ahead and close out our keyframe editor since we don't need that right now. Then we can go on up to behaviors, go down to text basic, and in here you'll see we have a whole bunch of pre-made options for us to use inside of motion. My personal favorite happens to be arrange in. I also don't want this text to start happening until a little bit later once the background has popped in. So let's go ahead and click and drag that in the timeline to where our logo image is popping in. If we go back to the beginning and push play, we should have a nice little animation. If we wanted to shorten up the duration of that animation, we could find the arrange in parameter and I'm just going to shrink that down to that one second mark. Perfect, that is looking super nice. Now the last bit of animation I want to apply is going to shrink everything down in on itself. We could go in and manually add keyframes to animate everything or we could use parameter behaviors, but what I wanna use is a distortion effect. Let's go ahead and select the group that contains all of the different elements we've added. We'll go on up to filters, then go down to distortion and then select black hole. You can see it's already starting to take place on all of the items in our scene. Go on over to the left hand side and find the amount slider. Let's just drag that down to zero so that nothing is being affected just yet. Let's move our playhead to the last second of our project. Then we can go ahead and click on the amount slider to add a keyframe. We'll move Move forward to the very end of the project and we can just drag that up until everything has been shrunk down to nothingness. Now I want to smooth out this animation a bit so let's go ahead and open up our keyframe editor once again and we can see the black hole keyframes right here. Click inside of the keyframe editor, then push command A to select everything. From there, we can right click, we'll go to interpolation and we'll select Bezier once again. After that, I'll select this first keyframe and I'll hold shift and just drag this over quite a bit. Then we can select the second keyframe and we'll just once again, make a really nice S shape to our animation. At first, we should have everything pop in really nicely. And then at the end, it should shrink in back on itself. Finally, I want to add a bit of polish to everything to make it really pop out nicely. First, let's add some texture onto our circle. We'll go up to filters. We'll go down to stylize and we're going to select add noise. You'll notice here on the left hand side inside of our filters, we can adjust the amount. Maybe I'll bring that down just a little bit. Next, we can change the type. I really like how the Gaussian noise looks for film grain. Then I'm going to go ahead and set that over to monochrome. We could change the blend mode if we wanted to. And finally, I don't don't want this noise to be animated. Right now it's going to look a lot like static. Let's go ahead and change that by unchecking the auto animate box. So now it's just a nice almost paper like texture happening on our circle. Next, I want to go ahead and give our image a nice drop shadow. We just need to go on over into our properties and locate the drop shadow checkbox. We'll go ahead and enable that. Then we can go to the right side and click on show. That's going to give us a whole lot more controls to work with. We can adjust stuff like the distance, which I just want to drag out to something like 25 and I'm going to drag that blur all the way up to a full 100. Again, if you wanted to blur it even more, you could click
click directly on that number and keep going should you so desire, but I happen to like how 100 looks. Next, I wanna add some nice drop shadow onto the text. So selecting the text, rather than finding the drop shadow inside of your properties pane, with text items, you're always going to find it over inside of text under appearance. In here, you can see stuff like outline, glow, and then at the very bottom is your drop shadow. We'll go ahead and enable that. We'll set the distance to 25, and we can drag the blur all the way up so that it nicely matches our logo image. And finally, I wanna add just a little bit more shape to this backdrop. So again, selecting that circle, let's go up to filters, we'll go to stylize, and I'm gonna add a nice vignette. You'll see that gives us these on-screen controls here. Let's go ahead and just shrink that down quite a bit just so it's surrounding our logo image. Then we can go over to the darken settings and just drag that up so we have a nice dark edge. So let's go ahead and take a look at how all of this looks. Pushing play it has a really beautiful animation and it shrinks back down in on itself. So we've done all of this powerful animation stuff inside of Apple Motion, and we want to send this over to Final Cut Pro. Now we could just send it exactly as it is, but that wouldn't give us any control over it inside of Final Cut. Should we want to change something like the backdrop or the text? To change that, let's go ahead and publish some of these parameters. Let's go ahead and select our circle and find the fill color. If we wanted to make it so we could change the fill color over inside of Final Cut Pro, click on this down arrow and select publish. Next, let's go ahead and select our logo image and you'll see that under the image tab in here it says drop zone and right now that's set to off. If we wanted to make it so that you could change out whatever this logo image was for your future projects, we could change this over into a drop zone. To do that, go ahead and change the type from off over to drop zone. So now, should you want to, inside of Final Cut Pro, you could drop in your own objects. And what's really nice is they're also going to receive that drop shadow that we applied earlier. The last really important aspect I wanna show you about publishing over into Final Cut Pro is to set up your timing properly. This is a three second title that will show up inside of Final Cut Pro. But what if you want to shorten down this animation or expand out this animation way beyond that three seconds? Apple Motion will automatically retime all of your animations to be either faster or slower depending on how you expand out your title. But if you want your animation to always be a consistent timing, you need to tell it inside of motion. To do that, go to the very end of your animation, which would be the one second mark on this particular project. Then we're gonna push Shift M. You'll notice that that gives me this green marker. To change that green marker, we can right click on it, then select Edit Marker. It'll bring up this dialog window, which has a whole bunch of different options you can change, but what you can also change is the type. Right now, it is set to standard, which is just going to be your typical marker. But if you wanted to set the exact timing of your project, you can change change it from standard over to build in optional. Then we'll push okay. Everything before this marker is going to always take exactly one second to play out. Additionally, we can scroll to the end of the project where the animation starts to build out. We'll push shift M once again, right click, select edit marker. Then we can change the type from standard over to build out optional. And so now we have just told motion that this always needs to take exactly one second to play out inside of Final Cut Pro. Everything in between these two markers is going to always be stretched out or shrunk down however much we need when we shorten or lengthen this title inside of Final Cut. Pro. That might seem a little bit more technical than you were hoping to get with this tutorial, but it's something I desperately wish I knew from the beginning inside of Apple Motion. So now that we've published the different parameters that we want to use inside of Final Cut Pro, we've done all the animation, it's time to go ahead and save this as a template. Now there are no special buttons or anything you need to press, you just save it like you would with any other project push Command S. And it should be noted that Apple Motion doesn't save like Final Cut Pro does where every action is saved. You do need to manually save it much more like Adobe After Effects or something like that. Once you push Command S, it's going to give you this dialog window. In here, we can save this template as whatever we want to call it. So we could just call it Logo Intro Animation. We could go into our categories and I'll scroll down and find whichever category I want to save it as. And you could create even your own new 
category should you so desire. I'm gonna go ahead and just throw it into my tutorials category. If you wanted to categorize it even more inside of Final Cut Pro, you could create your own theme. For right now, I'm just gonna select none. From there, we can push publish. And because I've already created this exact project, pre-recording this tutorial multiple times, it's gonna ask if I wanna replace it. I'm gonna go ahead and do just that. So now Apple Motion has saved and published our template over into Final Cut Pro. So if I wanted to apply this brand new title that we just created, we could go on up to the top left hand corner, find our titles, locate whatever category you created, scroll down and we'll see that my logo intro animation shows up really nicely. We'll drag that down onto our timeline and if I push play, we can see how it plays out really nicely inside of Final Cut Pro. You'll notice in the top right hand corner, we have the option of changing our background color because we published that parameter over. Because this is a title and we added text into our scene, Final Cut Pro automatically knows that this is a title that we want to use. What I can do is click and drag directly on this title without affecting anything else. We could double click on it to type something new. We could change the font of it, the size of it, pretty much everything you can normally change with any typical title. And now that we've done that, all of the animations will still play out the same even with all of those changes. So that is the basics of using Apple Motion to to enhance your editing workflow with Final Cut Pro. If this video is helpful to you, consider pressing that like button as it does really help out the channel. Also, I have a full playlist with over a hundred different Apple Motion tutorials for you to get started. I have a brand new Apple Motion tutorial coming every single week, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that. With that being said, thank you so much for watching and I cannot wait to see you in the next one.